I mean, in the years when we didn't necessarily have that internal leadership, I'd always ask myself, like, what can I do differently or better to help them learn to lead, right? So, I, I mean, I took that on my own shoulders, but um, I think it was both. I think that they were some special young women who stepped up and did that, uh, along with, um, you know, having like a, a packet of standards that the team comes up with and agrees on. You are listening to the Bridging Impact Podcast, transforming leaders on and off the court with host Coach Furtado. Without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. I'm thrilled for our conversation today with Becky Bolio. She is the founder of Championship Culture Coach, which means she is a championship culture coach. Her program, when you implement, or the teams that have implemented at least three of the strategies, they have seen a 61% increase in the winning percentage, who doesn't love winning, in the following five games. And then after year two, 23% increase winning percentage. That's amazing. Um, I'm excited to have that feeling of positive culture in the air and synergy. It's a big thing that I believe in when I coach. So welcome to the show, Becky. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Justin. All right, let's dive right into it. I know that multiple sports were a, an important part of your life. I know that you've coached gymnastics. So let's take it all the way back. And just kind of have sports as a broad view. We're all about, you know, bridging impact and talking about the impact that sports have on our lives. But, you know, for you and in, in your life, how has sports, you know, and the multiple sports that you played growing up make it made an impact on you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I started when I was like two years old in diapers doing, uh, you know, mom and tot gymnastics class, uh, but played soccer actually competitively all the way through high school and then just gymnastics in college, but also dabbled in softball and track. Uh, but how has sport impacted my life? I mean, I think it's really shaped my identity and uh, all of my friendships. It's become my life's work and I'm just happy to I would say serving too, I think is a big part of me and who I am. And uh, so I'm just happy to serve more teams and give back to sport in really a, a new and profound way. Yeah. And you, serving is such a great aspect to leadership and it's such a great opportunity to learn about how to serve your teammates when you're an athlete. Can you share any, any stories or any times that you remember of like, you know, if you look back, you're like, I was serving my teammates at this point in time. And maybe even as an athlete, you weren't sure that you were serving. That's a good question. And I uh, was fortunate enough to be on two national championship gymnastics teams at the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse and then got to be an assistant coach under uh, two more but um, serving then yeah I think it was just like really getting to know every athlete and love them and I just uh, flew out and worked with a team in upstate New York last week but we really talked about you know for the upperclassmen it's not about judging them it's about knowing them and loving them and communicating with them. So, so I think uh, that's serving. I love that. And I think, you know, kind of diving right into the work that you're doing right now, you know, you have a, a minute by minute, you know, consulting program. And so that means I'm sure you're, you're watching what some of these teams and how they practice. And I'm just curious, you know, when you see a team that knows their athletes, what does that look like? You know, what does it sound like? Um, what, you know, what does it feel like? What's the energy in the room? Yeah. And, and you know what? You can walk into the room and you can feel it in the air is how I would describe it. And uh, there's just this whole nother level of chemistry about them. Uh, so, you know, an example is, uh, you know, our gymnastics team last year that I had coached, uh, you know, it was the week of St. Patrick's Day and they're all dressed in green and I walk into the gym and they're all doing just dance and, and you can just really feel that synergy in the air. I can tell you what it doesn't look like is, um, you know, designated clicks sitting here, here and here. Right. And I think who they warm up next to and stretch next to and sit next to on the bus, it all matters. Okay. So let, let's, uh, let's go back, right? That's kind of the feeling we want to cultivate as coaches. And, you know, I think 
the easier part from my short experience being a coach these last couple of years, the easiest part is the X's and O's. And not that X's and O's are easy. It's just, you know, it's, you don't have to deal with the emotions of it. You just put players in, and I'm not sure what the X's and O's look like for gymnastics, um, but for basketball, right? You put the player on, on the wing or, you know, on the block and they're like, Hey, just, just have at it. Right. This is where you do. This is the play, right? That's kind of the simple aspect in my opinion. And what the real magic is, and, and I'm curious, you know, when we're starting foundational blocks, how do we really cultivate that, you know, chemistry that feeling in the air when we walk into a room yeah and it's difficult right so only 11 percent of teams really have that like championship culture which means the other 89 percent of teams are striving to get there or don't know what that is but uh how do we do it uh you know I, it starts with having a clear vision and values you know and is the staff uh, and the systems within a team, are they aligned? Um, you know, what are the standards of behavior? What, is it, what does it look like? And not what's on the wall, but when you walk in, how do they train? How do they communicate? Is there a really high standard of behavior? And those, I mean, those championship teams, too, they're, what's different about them is they're on a mission. And there's that verbal accountability or calling their teammates up. Um, out of love because they're worthy of that high standard, but they're, they're speaking up. You hear their voices and then they don't like, are you okay with an athlete uh, having a tantrum after they miss a three point shot? Are you okay with, and if they're not, what do you do about it? Right. That makes a ton of sense. So let's begin with a vision. Um, when we are, and I think this is a perfect timing for me, selfishly, because I'm going to be getting to build the vision and mission of, you know, our, you know, my freshman basketball team that I'm coaching. We're building a, a vision and a mission. How do we make sure that it comes from, I mean, coaches obviously have an influence on it. But I think one of the things that I've you know, kind of recognized in my, again, my experience coaching is sometimes it's coaches team. This is our vision and it's my way you all are just getting on and being a part of it versus like, Hey, look, coach is the guide. He is the captain or, or she is, you know, driving us to where we want to go, but it's also a collective unit. So when we're building a vision and a mission, what does that look like? Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head and what worked, you know, three and four years ago with athletes, I don't think it's resonating in 2023 like it was even three and four years ago. So, you know, the vision and the values, um, you know, it's activities like uh, having the team come up with their values, you know, and, and a list of values. And, and when, uh, you know, XYZ basketball team, when they're at their best, like what resonates with them and when they're not, what's missing kind of a thing. And so it's really asking the athletes to have some input into that. That makes a ton of sense. And so when we're creating like a vision, I think everyone wants to win the championship, right? Like, I think that's, you know, to me, that's, you know, a, a goal, right? But what is like a, how do we create like a vision with, you know, like, we're going to be a team that plays connected together, we're going to be a team that, you know, works the hardest, like, you know, when it comes to like building that vision, how do we create it in a way that, our team can control it because sometimes there's going to be, you know, experiences and, you know, whether it, you know, be a bad game and we lose, you know, because, you know, we're just off that day. And does that mean we don't reach our vision or what's that vision that we can really control within ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. The vision, I mean, that's tough, right? Because it has to resonate with each team and specific to their program, you know, so examples are, uh, you know, like we've had teams, their vision was moonshot thinking, right? And, um, you know, can a group of people come together and do something great? You know, and I think it was President Kennedy who said we were going to put uh, someone on the moon that decade. And we had no scientific reason to believe it, but um, he said it and they came together and then it did in fact happen in that decade. But um, you know, or a culture of love, but how do you create that vision? That, that's hard. I wish I could like 
communicate that into words that resonates with you or, or your people. But um, I think it, it has to be organic. It has to come from them. I think the biggest thing in 2023 is um, what we're hearing that's working is really seeking the input of the athletes more than we did even three and four years ago. Yeah, so like you it... said, the coach just saying here it is, um, you know, is there buy-in to that, right? Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you talk about the importance of that buy-in and, and why that matters so much? Yeah, because if there isn't buy-in, then you have some that aren't on the boat going in that direction. Or I used uh, the analogy of like an Alaskan sled dog team. You know, so what happened? And we actually had a couple of uh, athletes on our team that were professional or not. One of them is, I think, almost professional, but Alaskan sled dog racers and doing the Iditarod. But what happens on a team when one dog is laying down, you know, or one is running in the opposite direction? or one's biting at the ankles of another dog. Like, is that team going to be uh, as efficient in the race that matters most? You know, so that that's really culture. And yeah, so when there's not buy-in, uh, so I think you can win games in the regular season based on strategy and talent, but in the postseason, your culture is always revealed. That's a good point. And I know that I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact values, but I know the Arizona Diamondbacks, you know, are on this historic run. They're a team, they're a young team. And I'm not sure if you know the values of their coach, but it's something along the lines of like love, commitment, and trust, or I'm, I'm butchering one of them. And then I think there's one more. However, it's a team that like has like this, you know, culture and this identity that is, you know, bigger than, you know, Honestly, if you go and look at their lineup, you know, on paper, right, it's not going to be one where anyone is even going to pick them to get to the playoffs. But because of that trust, that belief, can you talk about how, you know, it, you may be able to, you know, and they only won 84 games in the, they're like one of the last teams to get into the postseason. However, now they're having a ton of success. So can you share a little bit more about how that, you know, the love and the trust and the championship culture really helps teams play together in the postseason? Yeah, and there are these special teams, like you described, the Arizona Diamondbacks, where the output of athlete one plus the output of athlete two is greater than three. Hmm. And, and so it's like the math doesn't even add up, but there are these special teams like you're talking about the Arizona Diamondbacks where there's just that synergy about them. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, it's really cool to see. And I think, you know, what I feel like one of the questions that, that I would have a, as a high school coach, particularly is sometimes we have talented players that may not buy into that culture. So how have you faced that, you know, kind of question before in your own coaching experience or your co consulting experience? Yeah. And, and that's hard. And uh, I can't pretend to have all of the answers. Right. But I think right. it's just like leaning into those hard conversations and why, you know, what barriers do they have to um, getting on the same page with the team? What's holding them back? Yeah. 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 Having those, having those tough conversations are important and I can share something from, from yesterday, you know, it wasn't necessarily um, like a super hard conversation. I just recognized that an athlete hadn't showed up. He hadn't been communicating with me and he was there yesterday. He just was not engaged. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to call him over. Right. You know, like sometimes as coaches, we just like assume they're, they're mad at us. And I, I work with younger athletes too. So it probably depends on the age and stage of, of the athletes we're working with. Um, and I was just like, you know, is everything okay? He didn't really open up too much to me. I was just like, I just want to check in and make sure you're okay. And he like gave me a hug. He's like, thanks coach. You know, like, Aww. just like even, you know, recognizing that I think, you know, I saw that something wasn't going right. You know, even though he didn't open up to me, like what really was going on, I think just having someone in your corner that cares to make sure that you're doing okay as a person. Right. Cause I think, you know, I, I'd love to pivot and talk about, you know, the importance of, of for coaches to meet their players and, and, and connect with them as people before their athletes. Can you talk about the importance of that? Yeah. You know, like they don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. So I um, tried to be about coaching the person first and then the athlete second. 
Yeah. So it's just like really getting to know them and love them and, and what, what's their family like? When's their birthday? You know, what are they yeah. walking through right now? What's their hardest class? What's their favorite class? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's so important. And then with that, you know, in your experience of coaching for, for 18 years, I'm sure you've got to watch a lot of your athletes grow up and, and, you know, get married and get jobs. You know, can you talk about that rewarding feeling and experience it's like as a coach to watch your players grow? Yeah. I mean, that's really why we do it, right? Like my avenue was through the sport of gymnastics and yours is through the sport of basketball, but but that's really why we do it, just to to be a part of their lives in those uh, pretty important years, and to think that their experience on on your team uh, like continues to serve them in right. you know decades to come. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's that's fascinating. And when it comes to one of the things I've heard is that the average coach will impact more people in a year than the average person person will in a lifetime. Right. I really think I believe that, but just because of our, you know, opportunity and influence that we can have, especially with young people. Um, and, and when it comes to that and recognizing that just the importance of that position, what are some of your favorite memories from coaching high school gym or college gymnastics? Uh, so many. Um, I mean, some of the, the championships, you know, we finished second in the country in 2019 and third in 2023, but some of the championships, but honestly, I have to say like the funny stories, you know, the dance parties on the bus and the blanket forts and uh, you know, they'd, they'd come in and prank my office. So I've had like 400 balloons in my office mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, yarn that I couldn't even get to my computer because yarn was strung everywhere. And, um, you know, so some of the funny stories I'd say, uh, but also, you know, I, I can remember a time last year, Justin, where an athlete had fallen, uh, off the balance beam. And I heard her and saw her whisper, I can do this. And that she was a freshman, but just um, she was really tough on herself to start the year. But to see that growth in her, even in one year. Yeah, I think it's like those special moments. Yeah, that, that is really cool. And I think those moments of, of teamwork and camaraderie, however, that, that last year story you shared is actually a great point where I'd love to, you know, segue and have a conversation about is kind of the, the mental aspect. And, and I know that gymnastics, I think, you know, from what the little bit I know is like people who play or, or compete in gymnastics are probably some of the hardest people on themselves. Right. So it's just because you have, it's such a technical sport. You have, you're getting judged and you have to get like tens and it's, you know, there's, just micro movements and you can get certain points docked. Um, can you talk about the importance of teaching our athletes how to kind of respond in, in, in productive ways versus, you know, being self-destructive, especially mentally in what we say to ourselves? Yeah. The self-talk is so much of it, right? The self-talk and there's times in our life where we should talk to ourselves and not listen to ourselves. Uh, and I think it, uh, and I could, I could be getting his name wrong, but Dr. James Gills, Dr. Gills, uh, he runs a triathlon. I want to say he's in his sixties. I saw a newspaper article about it, but he, uh, runs a triathlon and then he runs another, uh, goes to sleep, gets up the next day and runs another triathlon. So, you know, this newspaper article talks about if Dr. Gills were to think about how he feels and listen to himself, he would think I'm too old. I can't do this the next day. I'm too sore. Right. But if he talks to himself, he, he can say like one foot in front of another and I've got this and like focus on the next mile, the next thing. Yeah. Okay. So instead of like. You know, because we all have those thoughts, right? Like in, you know, bombarding, whether it's, you know, we're playing sports or we're, whether we're sitting on the couch and thinking about some sort of business thing or personal thing, right? Instead of listening to it, it's like talking to ourselves, like making sure, hey, one foot in front of the other. Or, you know, I feel like a lot of times, you know, my my thoughts that come into mind, sometimes they're things that I cannot control, right? And so, you know, focusing on, on what we can control and controlling our standards as coaches and, and focusing on, you know, what we emphasize. Can you talk about how, you know, the standards that, you know, we 
we preach and, and, and we reemphasize and we celebrate really helps and shapes our culture. Yeah. And, and the standards are everything, right? But, um, you know, I think it's really like, what are we okay with and what do we allow? Right. So if an athlete um, comes late to practice and then does it again tomorrow and the next day and then starts in Friday night's game. Right. What kind of standard did we just like set for our team? Right. So really out of love. I mean, my recommendation would be for that athlete not to start. Right. Because then you've just raised the standard of out of, of your team. Yeah. 100%. And, and also asking them. I mean, I, again, I think uh, there's just been such a change in NCAA sports in the last couple of years with the student athlete voice and NIL and the transfer portal. But really um, leaning in to the athletes and asking them, what did they think? Do they think A is best for our team or B? Uh, and what we're hearing is when coaches do that, uh, a team goes harder in a direction that the coach supports than if it was the coach demanding all of it, right? Hmm. Gotcha. So, so average teams, the coaches are leading, right? Right. But elite teams, those players are holding the standards. And I and feel so like it's not asking the players what do they think should happen, and even having a, a packet of standards, but letting them vote on it. You know, what do they think? What are three changes they'd make? with this set of standards. 100%. And, and exactly what we talked about at the beginning, right? Giving them that voice and, and, and whether it's A or B, it's just you have buy and you feel like it's more, you, you, you own part of it, right? Like if, you know, you were going to own a stock, right? Or, or something, you're right. You feel more compelled. And, you know, I think one of the things is the challenging parts is making sure that we connect with all of our athletes, just not just the ones who play, you know, for, for basketball, it's about nine or 10 out of, you know, you're maybe 12 to 15 who are on the roster. Um, how do you make sure as a coach that you connect and have buy-in from everyone and including the people who may not be on the mat or the, or on the court? Yeah. And I'd be lying if I said I always did. Right. So I didn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. I think it's like really valuing every role and every role does have value right? So who, who is uh, the injured player that's standing under the hoop, catching the balls during warmups at a game? Like he matters. And if he's on his phone, right? And just like not fully present owning his role or the person who's videotaping matters. So for me as a coach, at least I tried to uh, just like recognize and thank those people. Yeah, that, that makes because a kind of sense. Because if, if those if those players aren't doing their job, right, the person that's hitting 23 points in a game may not be able to do their job. Right. And so for those that are practicing and working hard, like making sure that, you know, the others are, you know, the, the game game players are, are getting good quality reps, right? Um, if they're not doing their job, they're not showing up, they're, they're half, they're only giving 50% effort it's not possible to reach our fullest potential. So we need everyone to kind of bring that and channel that energy. And like, that's how we become great. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if someone um, isn't in a space to bring their full energy, I mean, maybe it's better for them to take a day, you know, right. and, and come back tomorrow when you feel like you can. Yeah. That's a yeah. good point. I think, you know, when it comes to that and maybe kind of the newer wave and, how do we make sure as coaches we're, we're, we're checking in with their, their mental health? I think it's obviously it's an art to it, right? There's no like right science behind, you know, you can take a day or, you know, you need to push through it. You know, if there's a big game coming up, how do you, I guess, what's your philosophy on, you know, kind of giving players rest days, especially, you know, I guess we can deem them important players or players that play on the compete on the mat or, you know, compete on the court. Yeah, I, I used to say like, okay, everybody gets one day off, you know, personal day for whatever reason that they want. But then, you know, even in recent years, last year said, well, what if you, you could benefit from what if you need more than one, then you should take that, right? You should take that. But then when they're there, again, they're just going so hard in a direction that as a coach, you'd support, like they're yeah. fully there. So I'm I'm a big believer in in allowing that. And I think that you're going to get more effort and energy than if uh, we don't allow for that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think one of the things I had on 
Joanne McCallie, she coached at, at Duke University basketball. Um, what she would say is like, you know, make sure you can give them their mental health days, but also check in with them and make sure that they're taking care of themselves. Are they eating enough food? Are they, you know, making sure that they're doing their homework, right? And, or are they falling behind in their stress? Are they sleeping enough? So checking in with them just about how they're doing, what they're doing in their personal life, right? And making sure that they, yeah. you know, because you know, at the end of the day, we're kind of teachers, right? Teachers of life and teaching them how to, you know, balance and, you know, obviously, you know, you have to prioritize your sport when it's in, in season and, and college sports it's like that's like a full-time job right so it's it's a lot of work between you know being a, a collegiate gymnast and also you know being a student so it's kind of that that art but that's the life lessons and the teachings of all of it yeah my former coach uh, julie castellano she did things like are we above the line or below the line mm -hmm. today or like how are we feeling Right. And then check in with a partner and in small groups, talk about that. But, um, you know, just for as a coach to be able to kind of eyeball that and then check in with a couple of athletes. You know, we'd even ask how many hours sleep did you get last night and modify workouts based on that. Because uh, when we were really in tune with them, then we're going to be healthier and less injured than if we're just sending, you know, every workout at a 10. Uh, those were the years that we were more injured, unfortunately. Right. I know it's yeah. such an art, right? To like, we, we want to have this practice plan. We always want to be going 80 to 100%. However, I feel like, you know, that's not listening to, you know, where our athletes are at. And so can you talk about how you probably shifted right from the beginning, maybe beginning of your coaching when you're like, we're always going to go hard to like, you know, kind of moving and, and meeting and can you talk about how you almost have to like, let go a little bit of your coach and ego and expectations, because it feels <laughs> like, you, you feel like you're not doing enough. However, I think it's more sustainable in the long, long run. Yeah, definitely. As a younger coach, you know, I would say just, um, yeah, going at a 10 all the time. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think I knew enough to like ask questions and to listen and check in on how they were doing. But even, you know, if you go hard Monday, Tuesday, then Wednesday should really be recovery type of day. Right. Uh, so knowing and understanding that much better uh, definitely kept us healthier. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it is super important, right? Injury prevention is huge. And, you know, especially, you know, for athletes, even I feel like have come to the high school age stage because they're playing, you know, sports all year round. I'm not sure if, if club gymnastics is a thing, if they're competing all year round, you're like, yep, yep. yep. So, I mean, that's a lot of stress on tendons, joints, ligaments that are still growing and developing. And, you know, I have training programs, so I know that I'm trying to figure out certain ways of, you know, it's, it's great to play multiple sports. So maybe on a Saturday, instead of, you know, I'm thinking maybe more off season, you're playing, you know, if your sport is basketball, you're playing some flag football, you know, you're still getting some movement in, but you're changing the certain ligaments and muscles that are getting worked all the time. And so, you know, can you talk about how you made sure and, and you designed into your program like injury prevention and, and, and long longevity. Yeah. Um, and I, I never understood, like, why did we wait until an athlete was injured? And then we go see the athletic trainer. <laughs> right. Right. When what like what kinds of preventative things can we do, you know, like uh, preventative ankle therapy and balancing on one leg with our eyes closed and, um, you know, proper landing technique are our knees pointing out over our second toe when we land you know our feet shoulder width apart those kind of things um but yeah just even the progression of the week too so um like again if you go hard monday tuesday that then wednesday is recovery and i used to think it was rest uh, but it's really like the blood flow through the muscles at a five pace you know a 20 minute bike or swim kind of a thing and you're not going at an eight or a ten you're going at a five Right. And that that's like the best way to recover. No, I wouldn't say that's um, necessarily my area of expertise. It's more the culture, but, um, you, you know, still happy to share some of the things that I've learned or mistakes that I made early on. Yeah, it's an important part of the culture, right? To not, not burn our players out. And I think that that is a really important part of it is is instead and having active recovery and, and movement, especially for our athletes who, you know, especially for the high school ones who sit at, you know, they're sitting in chairs, probably what, four to six hours a day, depending on periods. And I mean, even for college athletes, they're sitting 
you know, in at desks and, and working and we have to move and, and get that blood flow, which is really important. So kind of getting back and shifting back to our, you know, kind of last, what, what, what would you say, what's the end of like a, a, a meet for gymnastics? Is it like, it's not the fourth quarter. It's like, um, is there like a last it's just stage? the last event, the fourth event. All right. So we're moving into the fourth event for our, for yeah. our podcast conversation. And I think, you know, where do you see, you know, kind of, teams having the biggest area of growth and need for growth when it comes to building their team culture? Mm, That's a good question. I think it's so specific to the team, but the commonalities I'll tell you, the teams I've worked with recently uh, is the need for that verbal leadership and verbal accountability amongst the athletes is a big area for growth. Um, so, you know, I support things like, uh, the athletes leading a couple of practices Mm. and I've called them silent, but supportive practices where, you know, you task a couple of the athletes with coming up with the practice plan and then speaking up and leading it and holding their own teammates to that high standard. Uh, the coaches are on the side and they're silent and supportive and they can, you know, cheer or answer questions. Um, but it, it's trying to give them spaces so that the athletes are holding the high standards, you know, that or uh, like leadership development. Uh, I like Jeff Jansen's books myself and the captain's manual. So going through that with uh, either the whole team or a set designated leaders a couple times a month, I'd say that's a the, probably the biggest uh, missing component of some of these teams. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And I, I see that too, especially at the varsity level, you know, as players get more talented, I feel like almost the, the leadership void, sometimes it, it becomes more apparent, so to speak. And so, you know, you, you shared a couple of good ideas. And so for me and, and the other coaches that are listening, even the parents that want to help and, and start developing leaders, like, you know, you, you talked about the importance of maybe having them lead a practice, right? Or it could be leading a drill, you know, kind of starting smaller. Can you share other different ideas on how do we, you know, number one, recognize maybe some of more of our verbal leaders and then, you know, develop and nurture their abilities? Yeah. And I think um, some of it, too, like you said, Justin, is like telling stories about uh, teams that have held each other accountable. Right. So uh, we've had a team where uh, it was Kelly Huseman and Kaylee Jondal were their names, but we hit something like you know, four out of six of our show routines together at one time, right? And and maybe this would be, um, you know, I don't know what the comparison would be in basketball. Maybe you can help translate that. But uh, it, it wasn't very great. But right afterwards, one of them, Kaylee said, uh, we're doing that again, and that's not to our standard. So we're doing it again from the top. And as the coach, my mouth just hit the floor, and I'm like, what? I mean, you heard her. Okay, we're doing it again, right? Um, or uh, another example is we had we have a dry season, so the athletes don't drink alcohol January through March. And uh, one year, one of the freshmen went out and drank, and I didn't hear about it yet. Uh, uh, but a couple of the leaders, uh, they texted the whole team, had them all come in at 6.15 on a Saturday morning. They did sprints. And they said, okay, now this is done and dealt with, and we're not going to talk about it anymore, and uh, and it's not going to happen again. And so I found out about it two weeks later, and again, I'm like, oh my gosh, right? So I think even sharing some of those stories of when that happened, and just like what a special um, thing it is to be a part of a team like that. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. And, and my initial question is like, did you have those conversations with, you know, the certain seniors or team leaders that held them accountable, like prior, like if, if something was going to happen? Or do you think these, you know, certain athletes that you had on your team were just like, quote unquote, special or, or you know, because that's like a really cool story where they're holding each other accountable. And they're not even getting coach involved. Yeah, Uh, I'd say both. I mean, in the years where we didn't necessarily have that internal leadership, I'd always ask myself, like, what can I do differently or better to help them learn to lead? Right. So, I I mean, I took that on my own shoulders, but um, I think it was both. I think that they were some special young women who stepped up and did that uh, along with, um, you know, having like a, a packet of standards 
that the team comes up with and agrees on. Uh, and, you know, these twice a month kind of leadership meetings. And yeah. for those leadership meetings, would, would they happen like in a classroom or did they happen like, you know, after a practice on a mat? Like when did you, you know, because I know that that's the challenge, I think, especially, you know, and I'm sure it's in gymnastics, but like, you know, with b basketball, sometimes they're like, oh, we have to do this, this and this, you know, it's going to take away from our X's and O's time because there's only so much time in a day. You only have so much time you can meet with the team, especially if you're a high school team. However, it's also building the culture like we've kind of talked about this whole episode is it actually leads to winning, um, which is what our goals are. Um, right. you know, can you talk about how you prioritize that and, and where and when you do those? Yeah, it, we did just do it after a practice, you know, on a mat, in the classroom, in the bleachers. Yeah, I mean, even 30 minutes kind of a thing. Um, I mean, I, I think it's worth investing in. So if you shorten practice by a half hour to do it and and for them, I mean, there's so many of them that are, you know, physical therapists and occupational therapists and these, you know, boss women that are killing it in sales. And and they they talked about that you know, some of these leadership skills that they learned help them become these amazing managers later. So, you know, it's really an investment in them is hopefully how, you know, your athletes can see it. Absolutely. And, and so for that, those leadership kind of, you know, workshops and exercises, can you give a couple of examples of what some of those workshops dive, dived in on? Um, yeah, like I said, we used uh, Jeff Jansen's captain's leadership manual so there's some really great things in there um let me think if i can think of a specific example i mean a lot of times we just like reflect on where athletes were and and even the whole team and how to help each one of them like move along or show up for them and then we'd uh break it down like okay you know who's gonna connect with her and who's gonna if they're resistant or reluctant you know and they're not uh committed or compelled yet right um it's just like who's gonna connect with them and follow up yeah yeah and i feel like probably just you know kind of continuing to reiterate so if you do like a development session and then kind of you know reiterating that point in, in the next practice session you know we talked about commitment and, and then celebrating a certain athlete that that demonstrates that and so you know continuing to to develop on it and, and help them, you know, kind of reflect. I think that's a big one that I'm, you know, really believe in as well is like, if we can give our athletes a skill and tool to become more self-aware versus like always having coach tell them, oh, you did well at this, or you improved at this, like getting them to kind of start thinking for themselves. Yeah. And just asking the question, I mean, that's what I think athletes right now. Um, yeah. Like ask the questions for them to find their own right answers. Absolutely. So my final question for you is, um, you know, when we're building championship team cultures for the coaches and, and even the parents that are listening, what would be the number one takeaway you would want them to come away with from this conversation? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, uh, and you'd say for the coaches? Coaches and, and yeah, we can go coaches and, and even for the parents that are trying to be proactive if their parent, if their kids happen to listen to them at this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot, but I would say, you know, um, just really showing up for the, like having high standards of behavior and, um, when that doesn't happen, what do you do about it? Right. Hundred percent. Yeah, having that. So there, there should be some sort of like accountability. And then, in my opinion, and again, it's out of love. Yeah, and so but for, it, you know, is it uh, that the athlete doesn't play? Is it asking hmm. the athletes? You know, do they think A is best for our team or B? Yeah. So having accountability yeah. options, and then maybe having a team, you know, kind of vote on it or kind of getting a gauge for it. However, like this is a, this is what we agreed to instead of having, you know, kind of what we talked about coach rules, this and that. However, there needs to be some standards, you know, and, and accountability for what happens because, you know, what happens when you show up late for a job interview, you may not get the job. Right. So the, these are such important skills that we're teaching. 
And I think so often as coaches, um, many, we make the decision based on like what's best to win that game that week versus uh, that might hurt your team's culture over the course of the season and hurt you when it matters most. Right. So if we can step back and make the decision, the hard decision of what's best for your team in the long term, I think that's where our best our best teams and our best cultures and best selves lie. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Make always making that sure that the decision aligns with our vision and values and our long term development for our athletes. I, I believe that's what's most important. So where can people you know find and connect with you um, if they want to learn more? Yeah, so the website is www.championshipculturecoach.com or via email, Becky at championshipculturecoach.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Becky. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I am now out of pages of notes in this notebook. All right. And thank you so much. Thanks, Justin. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like subscribe leave a comment and a review on whatever platform you're on it's the best way to help us grow we appreciate you for doing that we'll shout you out on social media i'd also love if you connected with me on social media let me know your thoughts and this is why i do it i want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward make an impact on the world so stay tuned stay subscribed Cheers.